the last pieces of the puzzle uh, is what we're going to focus on today or, or actually not the part of the puzzle because uh, the last assignment all, you have all the pieces for the last assignment uh, already uh, you actually had them since last part more or less uh, but today we are going to focus our attention on a couple of things that uh, we haven't touched upon and that is accessibility for instance making the applications accessible for everyone uh, even if you have some kind of disability or impairment uh, we will also be looking at or we will not actually be looking at optimization because uh, I, uh, last year when this course uh, was uh, held in, 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 uh, in Kalmar uh, this part was a read-up assignment, so, so everyone, we provided resources and everyone could read up on those resources. Now I noticed when preparing for this, today's lecture, I noticed that the accessibility references I had was me lecturing in Swedish. So uh, I have um, replaced those parts with my introduction to accessibility today instead. The optimization parts, however, is still... Uh, uh, up to date so you could use them on, on the course web page and I will get ba back to that later. So the first part of this lecture will be actually lecture 9 optimization and accessibility but we will focus on accessibility today. The next lecture that will start in 45 minutes or an hour so this will be a two-part lecture uh, will focus on uh, the fun stuff. Uh, the the new APIs that are upcoming, what will we be able to do in the future in the browser. Uh, of course, I will not go into depth of all of those APIs because that's not interesting, but I will try to present the whole picture of what is upcoming um, so that you know that, okay, if I'm going to do this kind of application in the future, hmm, maybe I could use the browser instead of a native application. But that's after the break. So we start off by looking at optimization and accessibility. Uh, while I remember, I got a question about uh, re-examinations. The re-examinations in the courses are not planned yet. Uh, however, I could say as much as next week we will have the, uh, uh, the first examination of the, the third assignment uh, on Wednesday, just like we've had the other times. Uh, we will probably do it like two of us will be here in Växjö on the third floor uh, in the B building uh, and two uh, probably Mats and uh, Jacob will be in Kalmar uh, over Skype and you will have the ability to book either on campus or uh, on Skype. And then we will have a follow-up a couple of weeks later uh, with a re-examination and that re-examination will probably co cover uh, assignment one, two and three so you will be able to, to choose on, on that that one whichever you like to to present. You could probably book several in that uh, uh, in that time space as well. We, but I, I will get back to that. Um, yeah, and as I said, it's a short period of time for this third assignment and that's, yeah, that's how it is and that's because of those nine weeks we have uh, in this first period, that's unfortunate. Uh, so it's a lot of work, but I hope you, I mean, the assignment could look really big in the beginning, but if you start to break it down, you will see that, okay, it consists of a couple of, couple of parts and, and I heard you discussing the chat, for instance, and, and that's, Working with WebSockets, as you said, is it's actually a really, really nice protocol or API to work with. It's not many lines of code you need to get it, get something up and running. Of course, you can add tons of error handling, for instance, and, and things like that. We don't have any requirements for that, though. Uh, however, if you do, please tell us on when you uh, uh, when you show us the application because that's a plus in the uh, in the book. Okay, jumping into accessibility, um, and this is, yeah, you can see what it says. Funny, I, I noticed on the train that I have a slide about the accessibility and it's hard to read, and that's kind of not what this is supposed to be about. But when I say accessibility, many of you will think about 
things like this. Okay, making ramps into buildings for, for wheelchairs and uh, having um, uh, toilets uh, that are uh, um, physically good for impaired people. Um, but how will this affect the web? Well, uh, we, have in, 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 we have a lot of rules that applies to physical buildings. Like you should, if you are a, a public building, you should have this and that, and the doors need to be this wide. You don't, you could, cannot have, not sure for the English word, but thresholds, yeah. Um, when you go into rooms and stuff like that. Uh, we have the same thing on the web. So the web is such an important medium today that we need to make it accessible for all, not only those with perfect vision, hearing, or uh, movement. Um, and if we look at the world today, a common number is that 10, 10 to 20 percent of all people have some kind of functional impairment. Uh, of course, a functional impairment do not need to be a handicap in a situation. I mean, if, 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 if my foot is, is bad, so I, I need a, a crutch when I, I walk, using the web will probably not be a problem in that case. So not all functional impairments are applicable to the web, but many are. And some are that you don't think about, um, or some are in, in other ways than you, you would imagine. And we will go some, through some use cases for that. Uh, and by making pages or applications accessible, we don't only, we, we don't only make them accessible for, for people with impairments, we make them accessible for all. So, I mean, I have kind of an impairment visually. So if I remove my glasses, I, I can't read what it says on the screen. But I have glasses, so in this case it's not a problem. But as we get older, the vision will become less good. And having accessible web pages will help us all. Um, so let's look at some, some, some impairments. The first I want to mention is hearing. And could someone give me an example? When is a hearing impairment, so you're, for instance, you're deaf, when will that be a problem on the web? Anyone? Yeah, developers might indicate something is wrong with the sound. You said video, right? Yeah. Well, video. yeah. Mm -hmm. video recordings, stuff like that. That's quite obvious. So, so just relying on a video on a web page will be really, really hard for someone that is deaf. Uh, and that's the one thing you will think of immediately. Okay, how do we solve it? Okay, so if you are publishing yourself on YouTube, you will probably not hire someone that will use uh, sign language. Uh, to, to interpret this one. But if you are a go uh, government uh, organization, if you are uh, part of, of, of the public, you might need to do that. You might need to, to add subtitles, for instance. Uh, and there are rules uh, surrounding this for, uh, uh, for the public. Uh, or the, the, I'm not sure what it's called in English, the governmental, uh, facilities or, um, or governmental web pages, like the university, for instance. So, so if we have a deaf student that we actually have uh, in, in Kalmar, we are uh, obliged to, 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 to solve those problems for the student. Um, another thing that is not something that you think about right off, off, off when you see hearing impairment is, so what is the native language of someone that is deaf from, from uh, from birth. Yeah, so the native language, is, is, it's a sign language. So English or Swedish will not be the first language. Uh, and many of you are not from Sweden, and, but I guess you can kind of read some Swedish uh, sometimes, but you will probably know that reading complicated government uh, declarations is quite hard but it could be easy to read easier texts with, with less complicated words. Uh, and, and this is true as well for, for hearing impairments. So, so if you have sign la language as your first language, you will have English or Swedish as your second language. Uh, 
And writing texts, for instance, in, in, in a language that is simpler is something that we all will benefit from, uh, especially if you are, don't have like Swedish for, as your native language. So it's a, a big movement in, in this area is to, to, to educate people in, in governmental positions to write easier texts. But, but that's often the opposite because those people will try to write as complicated text as possible because they want to cover every situation in, in as few words as possible. And then it gets complicated. So, so many are educated right now to, to, to write easier, uh, at least in Sweden, um, and have been for, for, for some years. And you will probably notice if you go to many, many government sites, you will see that the language in, in many cases on the web is pretty easy, actually. Um, and in some cases, when, when working with web pages, uh, you will need to actually have sign language on the page. That, that might seem quite silly, but this is the reason, because uh, the language is not the first language, or the, the spoken language is not the first language. I just realized that I need a check channel up, if, if you have questions. And John will probably, maybe, maybe not, uh, uh, forward questions from Live Coding TV because I don't have that up. Okay, so that's hearing impairments. Uh, so this applies more or less to content. So when you're creating content, i.e. HTML, then you need to think about this. So write your content in a simple manner and uh, think about video and audio, how you, how you handle that. Uh, a more common case, if, if I would were to say a, 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 a disa uh, impairment on, on the web, you will f probably think of visual impairments uh, first off, because visual Im impairments will be uh, a, a hard use, use case to solve on the web, because we, we rely on visual content so much. I mean, texts and, and styles using CSS and and things like that is, is often very visual on, uh, visual on the web. Uh, and this visual impairments, I mean, that, that's a broad spectrum, uh, for all from completely blind from birth to, to, to color blindness. I, I, I mean, a lot of, especially men, have color blindness and, and mixing green and red could be a really problem. Relying on red and green for information uh, is, it's not really good. You should have other means of, of relying on color instead of relying on color. Um, and you can look at visually impaired. If you're blind, you will have another way of looking at the web page than uh, a seeing user. And you will do that by either have a voice reading the web page for you uh, using a, a, a voice a synthetic um, voice. Just synthesis, voice synthetic something. I'm not sure of the English word. Um, so either the browser will read the text for you, or you will have uh, uh, this keyboard with dots that you could feel with your fingertips. Either way, those tools will not present the graphical image of the page, the one that you have created using CSS. What those tools will rely on is the HTML. And this is why it's so important to, to separate the design from, uh, from the content. So if you have a beautiful HTML page without CSS, it will probably be beautiful if you're trying to read it or uh, use uh, some kind of uh, uh, dots to read it uh, from a keyboard. Um, and one of the, you often say that the the lar or the biggest visually impaired user on the web is Google. Because, I mean, Google will see the page more or less like a, a blind person will, will see your page. Uh, and this get, get us, so, so if we are creating pages that are good for Google or for visually impaired people, we'll get the benefits for both. Uh, and, I mean, often it's, comes down to following standards in this case. I've been quite hard on you saying that, okay, you should use the new HTML5 semantic 
elements, you should place them in a good order, you should not focus on design when you are creating your HTML pages, and this is why. So if you just have good, plain HTML that, that works, it will probably be really good for visually impaired people as well. Uh, we have some edge cases or uh, uh, special cases that I will cover soon, uh, but I have them on the slide. Okay, so cognitive impairments. Though this is an impairment that you probably don't think about so often. Uh, and this is something that is uh, due to the brain uh, somehow. And it could be uses that are not able to, to navigate very well in space and time. And we can help those users by, uh, by making everything really clear. So uh, I, I had some remarks on some of the exam ones for some of you that you changed the menu up all the time so it was different menus on different pages. That's a typical thing that will make it hard for those kind of users because you're on one page and everything is structured. You click a link and suddenly everything has changed. The menu has changed uh, and, and you think you are on a new page. And th it's really, really uh, hard for, for people with uh, different cognitive uh, uh, impairments to, to handle those things. So when building pages, web pages, try to be as clear as possible using the same CSS for every page so it looks the same for every page or just use color or something to indicate different areas of, uh, uh, of the page. If you have like three sub departments or something you could indicate it with color that it's okay. But try not to, to just flip the menus around. <coughs> try al also something that many forgets. Try to always show the user where the user is. You have seen those breadcrumbs on, on many pages that indicates that, okay, you are on products, this product uh, details, for instance. That's a really good way of telling the user where the user uh, uh, is located. Uh, and also something that many forget is try to always mark the menu option that is, uh, uh, the menu option that is uh, active right now. So if I click uh, products, products in the menu should be marked in some way. It could be a, a, a bolder font or it could be underlined or it could be a different color. But try to mark it so that the user immediately sees where she or, or he is. Um, so this is one category of, of uses we need to take into account. Uh, we have the mobility impairments as well. That That is some kind of uh, numbness or some some uh, some kind of problem with using the mouse you could be very very shaky for instance have something that does that makes your hand shake um, if you construct user interfaces with really really small click areas buttons it will be a problem for this those kind of users uh, if they are heavily impaired they might even have you have seen some in some cases that you uh, either navigate using your eyes, just trying to look at specific areas, and this is not 100% precise, so, so those areas will flicker around a bit, or you have some kind of tube in your mouth that you could blow in different patterns to move a cursor. Um, and by making uh, interfaces that are really, really small, you will make, a, make it hard for those users. Uh, one example could be uh, what should, I didn't prepare this, so we will try probably hopefully lnu.se has done a good job on this, so we will look at that one. Uh, so this is a menu, right? And we, we could click this one to, to expand it building or expand forking in this case. Uh, one very common problem is that some all only make the text clickable. So in this case, uh, it's only possible to click the text. It's not possible to click outside of the text. And sometimes you have really big buttons, but small text, and just hitting 
the text is really hard. So try to always make the whole element that is interactable, make it clickable as well, so you can use the whole, whole element. Any ideas about where all users will benefit from something like this? Mobile. So when you're using web pages and, and they, there are no mobile web pages available, you will get this kind of representation uh, of, of the, the, the complete web page and, and the buttons will be quite small, but they will be even smaller if it's only the text that is clickable. So try to make clickable areas as big as, as possible. Uh, something that is really uh, common in mobility impairments as well as navigating with a keyboard instead of the mouse. Maybe you're not able to, to, to handle the mouse, so you need to navigate using the keyboard uh, in different ways. Uh, so, and this is a common use case. You should always, when you create, especially when you, you are starting to create web applications, not just web pages, you should always think about how could I interact with this application using the keyboard because it's a common use case. And I guess some of you as well use the keyboard when you browse the web because you're actually too lazy to move your hand from the keyboard to the mouse. I am at least. So I, I try to use the keyboard and shortcuts on the keyboard as much as possible instead of moving the mouse to scroll and stuff like that. Um, so try to, when you think of mobility impairments, try to make things big and clickable and try to incorporate the keyboard in different ways. Um, so when it comes to the keyboard navigation, uh, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, you could, for instance, uh, I mean, if I were to, to show an example, if I were to um, navigate on lnu.se, should we get the English version as well? So what I do if I'm trying to use the keyboard or only have the keyboard available, I will use the tab key to go through all the elements on the page. And what the browser does, it, it will take all interactive elements like a, a links or buttons or uh, input fields and drop downs and stuff, interactive elements, and it will add them in a tab order. And the tab order is beginning, if you, if you remove CSS and look at the top of the page, that is the tab order you will have on the interactive elements. So I could just tab myself through the menu. I could use shift tab to go back. Uh, and this is built into the browser. And I could press enter, for instance, and get to, to the research page. Uh, you can modify the tab index. So, so if you try the page and you see that, oh, I always get it in the wrong order, you could modify the tab index using uh, attributes in the HTML. And that's a good thing to, to, to try out and, uh, and, and modify if you need to. You can, uh, as well, if you like, you could uh, add, uh, I didn't write it here, but you can add keyboard sh shortcuts as well. Um, so, so you have, simple shortcuts for doing things that are common on your page. Maybe you have some kind of news flow. So by pressing L, for instance, you will always get to the next news on this news page. Um, the problem with shortcuts is it's hard to communicate them to the user. So there, there is beginning to be some kind of standard that using I, J, K, and L, like you use WASD uh, in gaming, you use I, J, K, L to navigate up, down, left and right, like navigating through articles, for instance, or scrolling down a web page using uh, K and scrolling up using I. But I, I don't think it's a written standard. Uh, so it's just some kind of ag uh, agreement that has, has built up over the years. Uh, so you could, could use keyboard navigation, uh, keyboard shortcuts as well. Uh, I will 
mention soon that we have something called ARIA. It's Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And this is a standard for creating applications, JavaScript applications on the web. And there are special ARIA attributes that you can put on, uh, on your HTML elements to, to tell uh, uh, tools or, uh, how to behave. And you can use them for, um, uh, for instance, telling something to be an interactive element. So when I used lnu.se and used tab, I scrolled through all the interactive elements. But I, I skipped, maybe I skipped some H1s that someone has made interactive. Then you could tell using area attributes that this H1 is an interactive element and it will be included in the tab order, for instance. Uh, and there are a lot of area attributes that you could work quite, quite hard with, or work really, really much with. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. And yeah, I, I will skip the first one because I think I have a slide on that one. And interactive elements. Um, try not to think of your third assignment. Um, you have this, you're creating windows, right? Small windows. And those will be interactive elements. The user should be able to move them around, click close, maybe maximize or whatever functionality you have built in. Uh, what you should not do, if you think of a window with an X for close, that X is probably an image because you want the close, the close button to be nice looking. So you place an image with an X and then you add an event listener to the image. So when the user clicks the image, you will close the window. The problem with that approach is if the user is trying to use the keyboard, they will not be able to tab to this image. It will not be included in the tab order. It's not an interactive element. An image is not an interactive element. So what you need to do, what you should do in that case is identify that, okay, I will have a close button. Which interactive element should I use? Should I use an A tag? Should I use a button with an image on using CSS? Should I use something else? Well, you can decide as long as it is an active element or interactive element. In this case, it's probably the easiest to just add an A, a element and add the image inside of the A element. And then remove the border if you don't want the blue border on the image. You can remove it using CSS. And then if the user uses the, uh, the, the keyboard, tabs to the close button, press enter, and that will generate a click event. Because if you attach a click event to a uh, link or an interactive element, an enter on the user keyboard will generate the click. So it's not just the mouse that generates the click. The enter uh, keyboard, uh, key will also generate the click. So this is a bad example. Uh, you should not do this. So in this case, I've, I have some kind of product, pro, product page with several products. And when I click a product name, there will kind of appear, appear some information about the, pro, the, uh, the product. If I click it again, it will close. Something like this. You have seen it on many pages. So what I do is I, okay, I query all H1s inside of a div called product, uh, products. Uh, in this case, I only select the first one. So this is uh, an H1. And then an, I add an event listener to the H1. And when I click it, click it, it will load information from the server and present it to the user. So this is not a good pattern because the H1 is not interactive from the start. So how we should do this uh, is we could have the H1 presented on the page, but when we set this up, we add an A inside of the H1. So, so, so it will be clickable. Uh, and if you do that, you need to think about paddings and margins and stuff so everything is clickable using uh, what I said earlier. So you can click the whole area as well. But that's only CSS uh, uh, working. And then instead of adding the event listener to the H1, you add it to the, to the A instead. So always, when you add a click event, if you're not adding it to an interactive element 
think twice. Uh, you could use ARIA instead, you could add another approach, and that is modifying the H1 and telling the browser that the H1 is an interactive element using ARIA attributes. That's fine as well, but you need an approach for handling this. So, when I'm talking about this, the assignment, you're not, we will not, uh, we, ha we have no requirement that you do the assignment that it should work with the keyboard. But if you do make it work with the keyboard, please tell us when you show it, because that's a plus as well. Yeah. Yeah, the memory game, um, yeah, actually, that's right. The memory game should be playable using uh, uh, keyboards, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I have, I have a demo of, of, of the memory game, and I, I will address that problem there. So you can look at my demo. It's, it's the whole solution, actually. So, uh, yeah. Wasn't keyboard navigation included in the demo? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And if I don't mention it, I probably did it by default. So, so, uh, uh, so basically, if, if we take the memory game, for instance, the only thing you need to think about in that demo is adding A elements to the images. And probably it all will work because when you tab through the, the tiles and press enter, the click element, so that will be the, the equivalent to the user using the mouse pointer. Uh, so shouldn't pose that much of a problem. But you don't need to, to work with the windows so that you could have some kind of moving the windows using the arrow function, uh, arrow uh, uh, keys or something like that. You don't need to implement that. But if you do, please tell us, because that's, uh, that, that's a good thing if you do. Uh, well, this is a bad, uh, it's hard to see, but I will read it out to you. Okay, so. If you're using images, which you probably are, and images that provide content to the user, that is using the image tag, because if, if the image is not providing content for the user, you're not supposed to use the image tag. You should use CSS instead. Uh, but if you are, we're having this picture of a cat on our page. For vis visually impaired people, they will not be able to see the cat. And if the cat is important for the page, then you need your uh, visually impaired uh, visitors to be able to, to make out what, what this picture is about. What you will see is that the alt attribute, and I think we have discussed this earlier, but the alt attribute is um, uh, mandatory on image elements. So you need to have the alt attribute on image elements. Um, you will get, if you validate the page and don't have the alt attribute, you will get, a, get an error. So what people do is they add an empty alt attribute. And that's okay to the standard because it's really, really hard to interpret it if the text is equivalent to, to the image for a machine. Uh, but what you should do, and in some cases, it will say cat. So, okay, that's better. But the, the user would probably figure that out if, the, the, if, if, if they could see the URL and see that it was cat.jpg. So, yes, say cat. Okay, we know it's a cat, but we know nothing more. So, in this case, a better solution is to, to actually write what you will see. A picture of a cat lying on a piece of a brick wall. Something like that. And you could be even more detailed if it's a, a cat site where you are, have different species or different kinds of, of cats. You could write the color of the cat, that it looks uh, into the camera or not. You could be quite descriptive in this, uh, this text. You should be descriptive. So cute cat. Yeah, so cute cat. <laughs> um, and often you think of of, of accessibility, that's something you should do afterwards. So, so you, you create, the, okay, I'm adding this cat picture, I will add an alt attribute in it later, I'll just leave it empty. And know what, it will be empty for the rest of the, the web page life cycle. So try to, when you add an image, try to add the alt 
uh, when you add the image. You have the, the equivalent on, on videos. You could uh, add the transcripts for video, for instance, so that the whole video is, is uh, transcribed in text, if, if you like. But uh, I, I will not cover that. But, but all visual content, you could always set an equivalent text uh, alternative to those. Um, so, uh, I will not go into the guidelines because that's a lesson per gui uh, or lecture per guideline, but there are two that are important for you, and I think you should know about them. You should know that they exist and kind of what makes them up. So, we have the WCAG, the first one, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and WCAG is for those creating web pages or websites. It's for creating HTML and CSS, adding pictures, video and stuff. So if you're into doing that, which you probably are, you should always have a look at the WCAG uh, uh, specification. And the latest one is the WCAG 2.0. Uh, there were a WCAG 1, but that's deprecated, so use the 2.0. Because in the first version, they said things like, if you have uh, a Java application on your page, it should behave in this way. If you have a Flash application on your page, page it should behave in this way. Of course, that is not compatible with the future. So in the WCAG, it says more like, if you have an external application, it, you should think about this and that. If you are using visual content, it doesn't say images, it says just visual content, then you should think about this and that. So this is a, a broader specification and it's quite good. It has clear guidelines that you could follow with examples. So if you look in the specifications, the examples are good. They will tell you how to avoid problems. So please go through those, those are really good. This is, has something called success criteria as well. So um, if, you're, if you have a company and you, will, uh, you want to have the contract for a web page for a government, for instance. So, so your company is trying to get that contract. Uh, in the rules for getting the contract, it will probably say that you need to comply with WCAG 2.0 success criteria AA for instance, because there are regulations telling the government that they need to follow those guidelines. So then you, in your proposal to, to, the, to get the contract, you will probably need to, to, to describe how you are working with, with implementing, for instance, WCAG in your organization and how you are used to working with, with those uh, success criteria. So they are really good to know in that way. That's WCAG, and that's the one that most people know about uh, when it comes to the web. Uh, the UAAG, I don't know if it's called YAG or something, but that's the User Agent Accessibility Guidelines. And this is guidelines for those creating uh, uh, user agents. And of course, a user agent could be a browser. So if you're a browser vendor, you should look into those guidelines. And if you're writing, uh, tools for reading web pages for visually impaired people, for instance, you should probably have a look at those guidelines. Other than that, you could skip them. And that goes into authoring tool accessibility guidelines as well. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think it's for uh, creating... I don't remember. If it's like online editors and stuff, ordering, ordering tools, or is it the tool? Ah, I'm not sure about that one. I haven't used it anyways, as you notice. Um, however, the second most important for you is the area, uh, accessible rich internet applications. And rich internet applications is more or less what this course is about. We have created a simple web page or website in the beginning of the course but we have focused more or less everything on rich internet applications. And, 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 and the application you're writing for a third assignment, it's a rich internet application. That's the term, the, it's a RIA application. Uh, and it's a SPA application, it's a maybe offline application. And, yeah. But it's a rich internet application, that's the broader name. Uh, and in this ARIA uh, specification, you could 
get a lot of information about how to make applications on the web accessible. So if you are creating web applications, you should definitely have a look in this one. Um, the uh, it's the W3C that is coordinating all of those uh, guidelines and they have a good page that you can visit with everything you need to know uh, uh, gathered in one place. Um, as it comes to V3C it's quite boring sometimes to read but uh, at least the way CAG guidelines is quite clear with good examples. Um, you could, I mean, there are validators, and this is quite common when it comes to uh, websites, that you use a validator, like you validate your HTML and you use a validator to see if you, you meet the criteria for WCAG. And that could be a good thing to use a validator to see, if, for instance, if you have alt attributes on your images, if, uh, if you have a good page structure, uh, you should definitely not use tables for layout, but I haven't spoken about that at all because that will pose a problem for, for those kind of users. Um, so you can have those uh, validators look into um, to that. Uh, however, you cannot today validate everything using a computer validator. For instance, you cannot, well, Google is on its way, but uh, I mean, it's hard for a computer to, to validate if that text is equivalent with the image it's trying to replace. So you always need, at least right now, you need to do manual work with those kinds of things. In the future, who knows, it will probably be better than us of, 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 of looking at images. Um, and if you really want a taste of, of how it is for a visually impaired user, you could try to use a screen reader, and that's a, often a good call-up sign. Uh, Chromebooks is uh, a Chrome-developed plugin. It's from Chrome or from Google. Uh, so it's a plugin to Google. You just install it like a plugin, and it, and it, it will start reading out the web pages for you. So what you can do is actually just install the plugin close the lid on your, no, don't close it, but just don't look at the screen or have a blindfold or something and try to navigate your web pages. You will get a pretty clear image about how other people's and, and, and uh, um, uh, search engines will look upon your page. Could be confusing at first, but you will probably learn just in 10, 15 minutes, you will learn a lot about what is bad and what is good on your page. Uh, and what you shouldn't do. Uh, so please try out Chromebooks. Uh, the biggest screen reader is JAWS. Uh, I think JAWS is available in, uh, in some kind of demo uh, version. However, it's a, 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 a program you need to pay for. Uh, but it's the biggest one. So if you're really into making those kinds of web pages, installing JAWS is a good idea. If you have a Mac OS, you can use the built-in screen reader. Uh, it's uh, something called NVDA, uh, and there are many more. But if you, if, if you really want a fast way of testing this, just install the plugin and, and, and try it out. I didn't know how to deactivate it, though. So when I started it, it just kept reading everything, and I had to deactivate the plugin to make it stop. But <laughs> uh, there are probably some shortcut uh, somewhere. Um, so, optimization. I will show you the course web page, uh, so you will know what to do. Um, so what I talked about now is accessibility, just short. And I have, um, I didn't show so much examples, and that's because I found a really, really good uh, resource from Google. Uh, where they go over exactly what you should and what you should not do and, and how you could use ARIA. This is 45 minutes, so I recommend uh, it's mandatory. Look at this as a complement to my lecture. Uh, you will get a more practical uh, view of, of some of the things. And, oh no, I did not. 
uh, if we go back to the web page, we will find that uh, we have some resources when it comes to optimization as well. Um, uh, a trip to the zoo, I think I've referenced it earlier, but that's about uh, how quick JavaScript has actually become. That you could do computation that is almost as quick as C++ in the browser. Uh, I think you could get into like two or three per percent uh, less performance than in C++ for some, some tasks. So it's, um, it's quite fast nowadays. Uh, yeah, I talked about more uh, progressive enhancement uh, last lecture and this is a resource for that. Uh, CSS sprites is something I didn't mention when we talked about CSS, but that's basically Instead of loading a lot of small images on your page, you can add them in one bigger image. You load that image and then you just position viewpoints inside of that image for, for, to show, show the smaller images. This is qu pretty usual uh, when it comes to, to adding like video buttons and stuff. So uh, have a look at that. Uh, a content delivery network is something I haven't uh, touched upon uh, either and that's a way of delivering content to the user to make um, to, to deliver the content uh, uh, near the user instead of making the user go fetch stuff on your server. Um, so have a look at this. After the break we take a 15 minute 10 minutes break because I think this one will be a little longer. Uh, after the break we will have a look at the upcoming APIs. So what's in the viewfinder for, for, for the browser? Uh, what is upcoming? Uh, and there are really a lot of interesting APIs that will make for some very interesting applications in the browser. I will show some examples as well. So 10 minutes break and then we will have a look at those, uh, those APIs. And as, as you know, the, I mean, this lecture is, okay, the accessibility part, you could have use for that in, in your application if you like, but this one is more for orientation. And you're free to implement, I mean, the APIs I will talk about, you're free to implement them in your application if you like but you will see that the compatibility is, 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 is the problem right now. Mm -hmm.